Welcome to Hot Chips 22. Session 5. Interconnects. Okay, welcome to session five on interconnects. Um, we have four uh, very exciting talks for you in this session. There is a discrepancy between the order of the talks on your paper program and the one on the web. Just to let you know, we're going to be following the order that's on the paper program um, this morning, which is um, Fujitsu, IBM, Luxterra, and then ST. Um, our first talk is uh, by uh, Takeshi Toyoshima from Fujitsu. He's the leader of the design team um, for the uh, Tofu um, Interconnect controller. So, Shimi. Generation Technical Computing Unit at Fujitsu. So today, I would like to introduce ICC, an interconnect controller for the TOF interconnect architecture. The ICC is key chip for Fujitsu's next generation supercomputing systems. So what are the main requirements for the supercomputing systems? The three main requirements is uh, low latency, and high bandwidth and RAS. And communication latency limits the scalability of applications. So it's essential we realize low latency systems. And high, band, high bandwidth is also important. Increasing calculation flops uh, limits, uh, uh, sorry, Increasing calculation flops requires higher network bandwidth be balanced with flops. And the last one is last. Reliability, availability, and serviceability. The risk of hardware fault in large systems increases along with the increased number of nodes. To answer to these requirements, Fujitsu proposed six-dimensional mesh torus interconnect architecture, known as TOFU. TOFU realizes both scalability and fault tolerance. The upper picture shows the TOFU interconnect. TOFU unit consists of 12 nodes, and uh, each node are connected through the two-dimensional mesh and one-dimensional torus networks. And each node is connected to the node, uh, node to the uh, uh, same position node uh, in the near TOF unit through three-dimensional torus network. In total, uh, these networks compose six-dimensional interconnection. To realize this interconnection, we have designed uh, New, new chip called ICC. The ICC has 10 network rings and four communication engines. Uh, four of the 10 uh, network rings are connected to the neighbor nodes in the TOF unit. And the remaining six uh, network rings are connected to the neighbor nodes uh, through the three-dimensional torus networks. These 10, uh, these 10 network rings and four communication engines are connected to each other uh, by a crossbar. And these communication engines also connected to uh, CPU, bus, 
CPU bus. So this is an overview of my presentation today. First, I introduce uh, implementation of the ICC. And next, I would like to uh, discuss about uh, discuss uh, some selected feature of ICC. And last, I conclude uh, my presentation. So let's see the implementation. ICC uh, is manufactured using Fujitsu 65 nanometer CMOS technology. The die size uh, is 18.2 millimeter by 18.1 millimeter. And ICC includes 48 million gates for logic and 12 million bits SRAM cells. These SRAMs are used for caches and buffers. And ICC also includes uh, 16 uh, I.O. ports and bandwidth is uh, 5 gigabyte per uh, second in each direction. And ICC is designed using ASIC flow and operate at 312.5 megahertz. And some parts of logic uh, runs at double speed. This picture shows the flow up around. Uh, as you can see, uh, ICC has two major uh, domains. Um, and the first one is the node domain, and the other is the router domain. So let's take a look at the uh, node domain. Uh, you can see the CPU bus bridge at the upper part of the picture. The bandwidth is 20, uh, 20 gigabytes per second in each direction. At the center part of the picture, four communication engines exist. Each communication engine has a communication terminal to the crossbar and uh, uh, communication terminal to the CPU bridge. And bandwidth, uh, bandwidth is five gigabytes per second in each direction. And one communication engine of four uh, includes a barrier engine. This barrier engine achieves the uh, first internal synchronization. At upper right area, you can see the two PCI Express controller. So let's see the router domain. Under the communication engine, you can see the small crossbar. This crossbar includes 14 ports, and each port uh, has a, uh, sorry, um, bandwidth is uh, five giga per second in each direction. And around the chip, uh, 10 link ports exist. Uh, bandwidth is five giga per second five gigabyte per second in each direction. This picture shows a fourth domain isolation. Um, zone, uh, zone in red means a node domain, and zone in blue means a router domain. Uh, hardware fault in node domain is isolated from router domain. It means a uh, router domain continue to work even during the hardware fault in uh, node domain, including CPU, main memory, and so on. Additionally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this feature achieve uh, system level availability and uh, uh, serviceability. In, ad uh, in addition, uh, radiation hardened free props, ECC protection, parties, CRC protection, uh, these features achieve uh, even higher uh, reliability. So let's see the future of ICC. This matrix shows uh, uh, ICC features. Uh, so today, I discuss about the topics highlighted in red. The first topics is the first RDMA features. Uh, boxed in green. 
And second feature uh, is uh, uh, network utilization features, both in blue. So let's see the first features. ICC support first RDMA. Software, uh, software uh, issues uh, RDMA command to ICC, and ICC uh, compose the packet from local memory user data, and compose packet to, uh, and send it to the remote receiver ICC. And receiver ICC's communication engines analyze the packet and stores the payload data to remote memory directly. ICC support uh, read and write operations, and it can transfer up to 60 megabyte uh, per each command. And software can specify the MTU size from 256 to 9020 byte. And ICC support multiple virtual address space for flat MPI. So, uh, RDMA communication require, requires also low latency and high throughput. So we therefore optimize command supply throughput and latency. And in addition, we use a uh, out of order IO memory bus. These optimizations are classified as uh, sender techniques or receiver techniques. First sender techniques is a uh, direct descriptor. Um, usually ICC use uh, DMA to supply the command. And DMA achieve a high throughput command supply, but it requires long latency. Direct descriptor feature high this uh, latency of uh, command supply DMA. And second feature is Piggyback. Um, piggyback feature uh, enable command embedded communication payload. So the combination of these features enable short message uh, sending without any DMA. So let's see the receiver techniques. Uh, first technique is out of order IO memory bus. It achieves high throughput bus transaction. And if software needs uh, in order completion of DMA transaction for buffer polling, uh, software can use soft, uh, strong order store. So let's see the first uh, feature. Uh, upper picture shows a normal command supply process. Software issue PIO and ICC issues the DMA for fetching the command. DMA fetching produce high throughput command supply, but it requires long latency because ICC can execute the first command after the DMA transaction. So picture, pictures below show the optimized process using direct descriptor. Software can issue the block store. It's a special form of PIO. Uh, it carry uh, 64 byte user data and it include uh, the first two commands. So ICC can execute this command immediately and simultaneously ICC fetch the following commands. This feature achieves the uh, high throughput supply and low latency communication. So let's see the next feature, piggyback. Upper picture shows a uh, uh, normal payload supply process. Software issue block, block store and ICC can execute first command immediately. But to send a packet, uh, ICC requires a uh, user payload data. So ICC issues a DMA and fetch the uh, user, uh, user data to compose the packet and send it. 
So pictures below show the optimized process using PDA bug. In short message, uh, the RDMA command and user payload data can be packed into the one block store. So RCC can send the packet without any DMA. It enables a quick uh, short message communication. So let's see the receiver techniques. In our systems, uh, CPU supports the out of order IO memory bus. Uh, out of order memory bus uh, optimizes the memory transaction and achieve high throughput communication. But uh, in this situation, software cannot apply the tail buffer polling. So ICC provides a two kinds of uh, polling mechanism. Upper picture shows the first uh, polling mechanism. It's a completion notification polling. Received packet generate uh, the a lot of DMA transaction. It's in out of order. So ICC guarantees the completion of all DMA transaction. And after that, ICC issues a uh, notification. This mechanism achieves high throughput communication. Uh, pictures below show the uh, buffer pouring mechanism. Received packet generates the a lot of uh, DMA transaction, but ICC issues the last DMA with strong order store. In this situation, CPU guarantees specified DMA ordering. In this manner, software can achieve the fast low latency communication. So let's see the performance. This graph shows the hardware measured result. Red graph shows not notification polling results. In short message, uh, piggyback cut off at 48% of latency. And blue graph shows the result of buffer polling. In every message size, uh, strong order DMA achieves a better performance. Uh, sorry. X axis represents the message size in byte, and Y axis represents relative latency. Okay, so let's see the second feature. Uh, we have two problems uh, related on network utilization. The first one is global unfairness of throughput and the second one is non-uniform application traffic in time and space. So let's see the first problem. Local fairness of arbitration causes uh, global unfairness. Uh, in this example, uh, all three nodes want to send the packet at full speed. So red Red arrow represents the packet from the node zero, and node zero sends the packet at the full speed to the node one. And at the node one junction, uh, node one has two input stream, a green one and red one. So the orbital of the node one treat this input stream fairly, so the throughput of node one is halved. After that, mixed stream from node zero and node one proceed to node two. Node two junction also halved the throughput of the mixed stream. So at last, uh, 
Node 0 can use the quarter throughput of Node 2's outgoing traffic. But ideal traffic is an equal one third throughput for the all three streams. ICC provides the injection rate control feature. Software can specify the inter-packet gap parameter. So example case, uh, software can insert uh, double MTU length gap. So communication engine works to control injection rate. Uh, so every three node can use uh, equal one third throughput. So this is the performance result. Uh, left graph shows uh, gap sensitivity. X axis represents the gap parameter from zero to 255, and Y axis represents the throughput of user payload. So gap parameter is uh, can control the throughput of the communication engines. And the right graph shows a result of the three node congestion, and the last example case. In right area, uh, every three node can use uh, equal traffic. And uh, at the 60 gap, uh, we can realize the good uh, best performance. And in re uh, left area, throughput is saturated, so node 0 and node 1 can use only quota throughput. Okay. The second problem, second problem is non-uniform application traffic. It's impossible for any application to use full bandwidth of every communication port all the time. So ICC provides the mechanism to use idle communication rings effectively. Uh, it's a uh, trunking communication. And ICC in the TOEFL unit has a four neighborhood node. So each node has an independent uh, three-dimensional torus network. So an uh, ICC in the TOEFL uh, TOF unit have uh, five independent paths to the node in another TOEFL unit. And an uh, ICC has a uh, four communication engines. So ICC can use uh, four paths to the communication, so uh, ICC can up to by four throughput. Uh, this slide shows the result. Left graph shows a uh, communication engine performance. So X axis means uh, uh, MTU size in byte, and Y axis means a throughput. So uh, smaller MTU size uh, causes a decrease of performance, but uh, ICC achieve high utilization with uh, one kilobyte or larger MTU size. And the right graph shows the uh, uh, trunking performance. By for trunking, uh, the throughput is saturated because of the CPU bus. But in other case, ICC realized the uh, good scalability. So conclusions. Today, I introduce about ICC. And ICC is the key chips for Fujitsu's petascale or exascale computing systems. And it's achieved low latency, high bandwidth, and sophisticated RAS. And today, 
in my presentation, I discuss about two futures. First one is high throughput and low latency RDMA, and second one is the network, uh, sorry, network utilization features. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Takashi. We have time for a few questions. Well, I'll ask one to uh, warm things up. When you were looking at how to deal with global fairness, you chose um, network yeah. injection control. Yeah. Did you look at um, doing age-based arbitration, which uh -huh. is an alternative? And if so, why did you pick injection control over age-based arbitration? Uh -huh. uh, uh of course, uh, hardware optimization can be possible, but uh, hardware optimization causes uh, uh, unexpected uh, performance. Uh, in, ra in large systems, uh, it's, uh, the accessibility is very important to achieve the Uh, sorry, uh, to achieve the, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, in large systems, the application scalability is uh, limited by the communication latency. So the hardware optimization called the JITA. Yeah. So JITA is, uh, has a bad effect to the synchronization. So we choose the software, software, uh, uh, soft, uh, software optimization. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Lloyd Dickman from QLogic. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that you had support for barrier operations. Uh, so, uh, barrier operations. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, just uh, briefly describe. Uh, your approach to barrier and what kind of performance you were able to achieve. Uh, so, sorry? Oh, uh, I, I, I was wondering if you could talk about how you did the barrier operation and and what your performance was. Performance? Yes. Uh, sorry, today I don't have the result of uh, barrier performance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. Uh, could you please tell us uh, what supercomputer will use the Tofu interconnect? And oh. could you also say what the status is of the uh, development of Tofu in the sense of functioning? Oh, uh, good, quick, good question. Uh, this Tofu is uh, used by Japanese national project, supercomputer. But I can't uh, talk about the detail of our schedule. Okay, so okay. the Japanese national supercomputer will yeah. use the TOFU. Yeah, K computer. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, let's all uh, thank uh, Takeshi again. Thank you. Our um, next talk will be a tag team on the IBM Power 7 hub module. Um, it will be given by Baba Aramili and Steve Baumgartner. Uh, Baba has been working on power processors at IBM, and he's the chief architect of the Power7 hub chip. He has over 100 patent applications filed and more than 50 issued. Um, Steve has been at IBM for 22 years, um, doing analog circuit design, working on fiber optic components and CERTES. Most recently, he's worked on the Xbox 360 and the Power7 hub chip. So, who goes first? I guess Baba. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here today at uh, Hot Chips to uh, present the uh, Pi uh, IBM's uh, Power7 Hub chip and module. Uh, the Power7 Hub module is a terabyte interconnect switch for high-performance computer systems. But as you'll see in this uh, presentation, it uh, has much more functionality than just a high-performance switch. Uh, first, uh, I'll give a brief uh, background of the HPCS program and perks. Uh, then we'll get into the Power7 Hub chip itself and some of the key functional units. And then we'll finish off with 
uh, the Power 7 Hub module and off-chip interconnect that uh, Steve uh, Baumgartner will uh, cover. Uh, DARPA's High Productivity Computing Systems Program had a goal uh, to uh, provide a new generation of economically viable high productivity computing systems uh, for the national security and industrial user community. Uh, now, this required a fundamental reassessment of uh, how we define and measure uh, performance, programmability, portability, robustness, and productivity in the HPC domain. Uh, weather prediction, climate modeling, and uh, ship design are just a few examples of applications in this arena. PERCS, uh, productive, easy to use, reliable computing system is uh, IBM's uh, answer to DARPA's HPCS program. Uh, we condensed the uh, general requirements into high level, three high level requirements for the interconnect. Uh, high bisection bandwidth, uh, low latency, and a high interconnect bandwidth even for uh, small packets. Uh, to achieve uh, high bisection bandwidth, we developed a hub chip with a very high fan out. Uh, to achieve low latency, we used a two-level two direct connect topology. And to achieve the high interconnect bandwidth, uh, including small packets, we from the beginning architected this switch to handle large and small packets uh, at the, uh, for bandwidth. And in addition, we've added functionality to uh, disaggregate and aggregate small packets uh, to eliminate the CPU overheads at the intermediate stages, uh, for example, like a global shared memory remote, remote atomic updates. Here's uh, uh, how we build a PERC system. We start with the uh, uh, eight core Power 7 chip. Uh, we put four of those onto a QCM, quad chip module. That's a 32 way SMP image. We attach one hub chip, which is a module with optics, and that we call an octant. We put eight octants, or build eight octants, into a 2U drawer, which has 256 cores. And Four of those are built together to form a supernode, which effectively is a building block. And in the full system, there's hundreds of supernodes supported in the architecture. Here's a logical view of the uh, PERC Center Connect. The uh, uh, boxes here, which are kind of light blue, are the actual octants, and there's eight of these. Uh, in, the, in an octant, there's the four P7 chips. Uh, here's the hub chip with some of the key units highlighted. Uh, the green is the actual drawer, and in tan are the supernodes. So for these levels of hierarchy, it's a two-level uh, uh, topology, so the blues are one level and the red is uh, the second level. Uh, there is a distinction in the blues, though, which I'll talk about here. The, we have seven uh, we call uh, L local links, and these fully interconnect uh, this hub chip to all other uh, seven hub chips in the same drawer. There's 24 uh, L remote links, and these fully interconnect this hub chip to all other 24 hub chips in the other th three drawers of the same supernode. The primary difference in these two is that this is a, a planar and these are optical, and the L locals have much higher bandwidth to, uh, in addition to cluster traffic, to handle uh, hypervisor traffic at the 256 way uh, 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 drawer level and general I.O. at that level. And furthermore, it, they're also oversized to handle, or, or being the preferential first hop for indirect routing to preserve the bisection bandwidth when indirect routing is used. Uh, at the bottom are the 16 D links. This is the second level of the, uh, of the topology. And these help fully interconnect this supernode to all other supernodes in the system. Uh, now let's get into the Power 7 hub chip itself. The Power 7 hub chip uh, extends uh, IBM's uh, Power 7 capability into the uh, high performance cl cluster networks. Uh, it does so while eliminating the uh, uh, routing and switching functions of the traditional networks. Uh, it's a low diameter, two tier fabric, like I mentioned, uh, mainly to address the bisection bandwidth and latency. Uh, and it's a very highly integrated design. It has onboard uh, integrated switch router, uh, it has onboard an HCA, which we call the host fabric interface. It's on board a nest memory management unit, uh, and uh, it also has uh, uh, integrated PCI Express channel controllers. Uh, key acceleration functions uh, on the chip all include uh, collectives acceleration uh, to eliminate the CPU overhead uh, at each uh, intermediate stage of the spanning tree, uh, global shared memory uh, to eliminate uh, when the accelerations include uh, uh, 
uh, eliminating CPU overhead for remote atomic updates, and uh, disaggregation, aggregation of uh, packets and intermediate hops as well, like I mentioned earlier. And finally, virtual RDMA, uh, where we eliminate the CPU overhead for address translation. There's a block diagram of the uh, uh, Power 7 Up chip. On the top are the four links connecting to the four different Power 7 chips, uh, an aggregate bandwidth of 192 gigabytes per second uh, bidirectional. On the left are the L local links for aggregate bandwidth of 336 gigabytes per second, seven of those. On the bottom left are the 24L remote links uh, for aggregate bandwidth of 240 gigabytes per second. And on the bottom right are the 16D links for aggregate bandwidth of 320 gigabytes per second. And on, finally on the right, uh, the PCI Express channel controllers with aggregate bandwidth of 40 gigabytes per second for a total off-chip interconnect bandwidth of over 1.1 terabytes per second. Uh, additionally, there's a, I want to just highlight a couple of the, how the internal units look. Uh, in addition to the link controllers, uh, we have the Power 7 coherency bus controller to which two HFIs are attached. Uh, they're attached with four data buses and one command bus each. Uh, the two HFIs share a nest memory management unit and a CAU, Collective Acceleration Unit. And each HFI has four ports into the integrated switch router, which is the gateway into the actual uh, cluster network. Here's a high-level uh, packet flow uh, through the uh, network. Uh, the uh, packets can be sourced from uh, memory or the processor caches on the send side, uh, and either injected or pulled into the HFI where the packet processing is accomplished and then the HFI will in, uh, inject the packet into the network, ISR network. On the receive side, the HFI, after doing the packet processing, uh, can either inject it in the processor caches or write to memory. Uh, now let's get into the units themselves. Uh, the first one up is the uh, uh, HFI host fabric interface, and uh, it provides the uh, non-coherent interface between the Power 7 and QCM and the ISR. Uh, it provides for communication through windows, and there are hundreds per HFI. Uh, the nested memory management unit provides the address translation for the HFI. And uh, since the HFI actually uh, sits on the uh, Power 7 coherency bus itself, it's able to participate on the send side uh, with cache intervention and on the receive side with cache injection. Uh, HFI supports uh, three APIs, uh, message passing interface, global shared memory, where uh, support for active messaging is both in the HFI and the Power 7 memory controller and internet protocol. Uh, HFI also supports uh, five uh, primary packet formats, uh, immediate send uh, for low latency, five full send receive for high bandwidth, and uh, IP, which also has a mode with the uh, scatter gather descriptors, global shared memory, RDMA, which has both the hardware and uh, software reliability modes, and collectives packets. Uh, there are four, uh, expanding on the global shared memory RDMA packet formats, there's four that are supported by the HFI. Uh, for large message sizes with uh, multiple packets per message, uh, we have a full RDMA, which is a memory effective address to memory effective address transfer. Uh, operation support include write, read, fence, and completion. For single packet messages, we have half RDMA. Uh, this is a memory effective address to or from a receive or send FIFO and supports uh, write, read, and completion. Uh, for atomic updates, we have small RDMA, which is a FIFO to a memory effective address. And the operations supported here include uh, add, and, or, XOR, and compare and swap with and without fetch. And finally, uh, we have a remote atomic update operation, which is a, also a FIFO to a memory effective address transfer. But uh, the, the, it's, it's, think of it as an enhancement from the small RDMA. In the sense, uh, this one supports multiple independent remote atomic updates uh, packaged into a FLIT, a single FLIT, uh, with a subset of the operations supported. Uh, but it also has hardware guaranteed reliability, while the other three modes are software guaranteed reliability. The, uh, now onto the integrated switch router. Uh, it's a, it supports a two-tier photograph network, has a, a 56 by 56 internal crossbar switch, which runs at 3 gigahertz. Uh, it's an input-output buffered architecture uh, with a 2 kilobyte maximum packet size and a split size of 128 bytes. Uh, link reliability is provided with CRC-based link level retry and uh, lane steering for uh, failed links. 
uh, the ISR has separate route tables for IP multicast support, and it also supports the global counter, which is a more like a time of the day function of the network, which can be used for OSG order control or performance tuning, among other things. Uh, moving on to routing, some of the characteristics of the ISR uh, network routing include a three hop longest direct path, a five hop longest indirect path. It uses cut through wormhole routing. And the ISR has uh, distributed route tables, including uh, source route tables for packets injected by the HF5 and port route tables for packets uh, traversing through the intermediate hops of the network. So the packets looked up piecemeal throughout the network. And there are separate route tables for intra and intra supernode routes. And uh, the one characteristic of the network is that the flits of the packet arrive in order, but the actual messages can be out of order. Uh, there are four route modes supported by the ISR. Uh, the hardware single direct routing, hardware multiple direct routing, and this is useful when you have less than the maximum number of supernodes so that you have extra D-links available which you can aggregate to provide additional bandwidth in a pair of supernodes. Uh, hardware indirect routing for data striping and failover. Uh, the algorithms include round robin and random. And finally, a software controlled indirect routing where the software provides a bounce point, but the ISR actually uses the route tables to uh, look up the rest of the route. Here's a simple uh, block diagram of the supernode. Uh, in yellow are the drawers, the four drawers. Uh, in each octant, you see the four Power 7 chips in blue, and the, in red is the hub chip. And within that is the ISR. Using this, uh, it's just a very simple example of uh, uh, a longest uh, uh, direct route. It's a total of three hops, 2L, 1D, and this provides for maximum bisection bandwidth. And again, depending on the system size, you can have one to many of these uh, uh, routes available. And here's the longest indirect route, uh, three L hops and two D hops for a total of five hops. And the total number of paths available, again, just depend on the system size. Uh, the, it'll be the total number of supernodes in the system uh, minus two. Uh, the next unit is the collective acceleration unit. Uh, the CAU provides for uh, reduce and multicast operations. And it uh, supports various operand sizes and formats. And with software rate, it can extend the coverage to all reduce and uh, barriers. And the CAU tree topology uh, supports multiple uh, independent trees uh, and has uh, 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 multiple neighbors per CAU, where each neighbor can either be a, a local or a remote CAU or an HFI. And uh, we provide the total flexibility of the software to actually set up the trees. And the CAU use, uh, for, uh, for reliability and pipelining uses sequence numbers uh, and, you, and depends on software uh, redrive protocol. But the key is that the CAU holds state uh, at the point of failure so that the redrive protocol uh, can restart the transmission at the point of failure, then restart the whole operation. And for reproducibility, uh, you would want to use binary trees, but for better performance, uh, you want to take advantage of the much wider capability of the uh, CAU. Here's the Power 7 hub chip details. You'll see on the uh, perimeter are the uh, various FIs. Uh, the ISR is right here. The HFIs, the two of those there. The Nest Memory Management Unit in the middle. CAU here. And the uh, Power 7 frequency bus controller here. Uh, this is a 582-millimeter uh, square millimeter chip in 45-millimeter uh, uh, SOI technology. Uh, it has uh, 13 levels of metal, uh, over uh, 440 million transistors, over 3,700 signal I.O., over 11,000 total I.O., and it's on a 61 millimeter by 96 uh, millimeter uh, 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 glass ceramic module. Uh, to wrap it up, uh, my section here real quick, uh, the key benefits provided by the hub chip, uh, they include uh, providing a petascale system with the global shared memory, uh, dramatically improving performance and sustained performance, uh, elimination of the uh, traditional infrastructure, and this includes uh, in all three areas, HPC networks, where the HCAs and external switches are, are not needed, and the FIs and cables are also reduced uh, relative to a, a factory structure with the same bisection bandwidth. Uh, storage, where the uh, fiber channel switches, uh, external switches, storage controllers, and DASI within the compute node are not needed. And in I.O., where we eliminate the need for uh, PCI express channel controllers. Also provides for a dramatic reduction in cost, as the bill of materials in the system are reduced and provides for a step function improvement reliability compared to commodity clusters which have the traditional infrastructure. 
uh, uh, full virtualization is provided and uh, with robust end-to-end -end systems management. And finally, uh, the hub chip provides for a dramatic reduction in data center power compared to commodity clusters. And now that uh, Steve will uh, take over and finish off with the Power 7 hub module and the interconnect. Steve? Thanks, Baba. It's not my lunch in the bag. I'll bring that all later. I'll provide a brief overview of the physical layout of the hub module, as well as a brief overview of the off chip interconnect for the hub chip. Main focus is going to be on the 10 gigabit per second physical interface to the optics modules. The WXYZ bus and the LL bus are used, use a, a proprietary interface. It's a third generation elastic interface. It runs at three gigabits per second. It's a source synchronous interface. Details of this interface were presented at the Hot Chips conference in 2007. The LR bus and the D bus are the optics interface. And we'll have more slides on that later. One of the main requirements for this interface is that the optics modules were not allowed to have any eye openers or clock data recovery circuits in them. So the only clock data recovery circuit is at the far end of the link in the hub chip receiver. The PCI general purpose I.O. is a standard compliant PCI Express generation two interface, runs at 5.0 gigabits per second. This is a CAD drawing of the hub, hub module. Baba was able to borrow one of these from the lab. It's kind of a, a mess right now. It's hard to carry on the airport. <laughs> um, this gives you a sense of the size of the thing, but the, the ceramic Substrate's about the size of the palm of my hand. It gets a little larger with the strain relief, uh, relieving the ribbon fibers on the ends. Um, it's hard to see colors, but the D buses are blue, blue colored optical connectors, and the LR buses are orange colored optical connectors. Oh. That's all right. I'll actually probably point to the slides. That's all right. Thanks. So the hub chip sits in the center of the ceramic substrate, and it's flanked by as up to 56 optics modules on the top and bottom of the ceramic substrate. The optics modules are connected to the ceramic substrate via an LGA interposer connector. The maximum trace lengths between the hub chip and the optics modules are not more than a few inches in length to minimize equalization requirements on the interface. This is a physical floor plan of the 10 gigabit per second phi unit. In the middle of the unit is a high frequency PLL. This PLL uses an LC tank VCO for low phase noise clock generation. To the left of the PLL are 24 transmit blocks, and to the right are 24 receiver blocks. The gray areas are reserved for analog custom circuitry. The blue and the green areas are reserved for synthesized digital circuitry. The yellow areas are reserved for some analog infrastructure, as well as a 5 gigahertz custom clock distribution tree this clock distribution tree was designed using differential buffers and coplanar waveguides to minimize the jitter generation out to the analog blocks. There are a total of 14 of these units placed on the hub chip. And if we have time, we could go back and show the chip. But there's on the left side and the right side of the hub chip. This is a list of features for the transmitter block. I'll point out some of these features in the block diagram on the next slide. There's an impedance, impedance calibrator block that's connected to an external precision resistance. The results of this calibration are used to determine how many segments get turned on 
in the output driver. There's a FIFO block that reads, that receives a 10-bit word from the protocol layer. That 10-bit word is synchronous with the protocol clock. So this five, but the protocol clock is mesosynchronous with the five gigahertz driver clock. This FIFO control logic block is used to train the unload pointer of the FIFO so that the data coming out of the FIFO is synchronized with the five gigahertz driver clock. The data is serialized through several stages before reaching the SST driver. SST stands for series source terminated. Um, it, it's a multi-segment driver. It can be programmed in a variety of ways to provide um, either no equalization or a vari variance of two-tap or three-tap feed-forward equalization uh, up to as much as 6 dB of feed-forward equalization. This is all achieved with a total jitter of less than 17 picoseconds at a power-to-performance rating of 3.2 milliwatts per gigabits per second. This is a list of received features. I'll point out some of these in this block diagram. There's an AC coupled input stage, and its purpose is to level shift the common mode from the common mode voltage from the two and a half volt driver in the optical electrical converter module. At the output, the common mode is shifted down to less than one volt to be compatible with the one volt power supply to the receiver chip. The data is then amplified and sent on to the sampling latches. We use differential CAS code voltage switch sampling latches. It's a total of four of them. They're clocked with four phases of quadrature-spaced quadrature clocks. The data samples are sampled in the middle of the data valid window, and the edge samples are sampled on the transitions of the data valid window. The data is deserialized to a 10-bit word, and that 10-bit 10 10 word along with a one gigahertz clock is forwarded on to the protocol layer and it's processed by asynchronous FIFO in that, in that layer. Clock data recovery logic processes both the data and the edge samples and produces phase rotator codes that are fed back to the phase rotators, which closes the loop and keeps the phase of the sampling clocks aligned in the center of the eye since the data coming in is asynchronous with the local clock on this chip. There's also a diagnostic latch, which has its own diagnostic clock. This is similar to what Altera presented earlier today. Um, we use this for end-to-end uh, -end link margining and determining the, uh, for bit array curves and eye masks, inner eye contour type measurements. This is all achieved with a performance, 80% uh, jitter tolerance performance, and uh, 4 point milliwatts per gigabit per second power to performance rating. Characterization of this electrical interface was especially challenging because if you remember the hub module, it's all enclosed. The ribbon fibers only escape out the ends. So to, we designed an interface board to interface the hub module to a Teradyne Ultraflex tester to get it out of the system. We also had designed some uh, um, flexible circuit boards that could probe the top side metallurgy of the ceramic module when an optics module was removed. We could then attach coax cables to make measurements of the transmitter or connect them to a serial data generator for receiver qualification. Here's an example of a 10 gigabit per second transmitter eye diagram. Here's an example of one of these uh, inner eye contours I mentioned. This blue area is the air-free area um, of a total end-to-end -end, uh, operational uh, optical link. The lower right corner shows some bit air rate curves. It's another example of characterization features we have built into the receiver. Um, these bit air rate curves show very good margins, even when extrapolated down to 1e to the minus 15th air rate. Also shows very good consistency across many bit lanes. So in conclusion, we present a 1.1 terabyte per second hub chip achieved with a combination of custom and industry standard IOs. We presented a CERTES interface 
It has very good jitter performance at very low power, very respectable power. And we've shown very outstanding bit error rate performance over the end-to-end -end optical link. Thank you very much. So. Thanks. While you're coming down the aisles to ask questions, I'd like to ask um, our next speaker, Brian Welsh from Luxterra, if you're here to uh, see the uh, um, audio people and get wired up. Um, so, first question. Hi, my name is uh, Roberto Giorgi from the University of Siena, Italy. Uh, I have a question on the first part of the talk, where you say uh, that you can provide a global address space for this machine. I guess it's a big machine, like thousands of processors, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, uh, you say that you don't have any CPU overhead to maintain coherency across this large system. So it's kind of strange to me. I imagine a simple situation where uh, I have uh, one guy, one processor, one processor writes, another processor writes to the same location. How can it happen that there is no overhead? I think when I, when I talked about uh, CPU overhead, right, I'll give you an example. Let's say remote atomic updates, right? So uh, specifically talking uh, in, for example, the, re the receive node, uh, it going directly from the HFI to memory controller with no CPU intervention at all for a full <coughs> remote atomic update operation. Similarly, in the switch, for all the aggregation disaggregation that traditionally is done, it has to come back because all the four different packages or multiple uh, remote atomic update elements, they're packaged together to cross the link, but they're not necessarily all destined to the same final destination, so they have to get broken up and re-put uh, back together, and that's usually done with the processors. So here, all that's also accelerated through the hardware. So that's kind of what I was referring to, uh, for example, in those cases. So it's not a real Co all coherent, uh, globally coherent uh, shared global memory. Shared memory is only for specific the global shared memory itself, right, for the programmable uh, global address-based languages is uh, software-managed coherency. So, but we've put the acceleration functions in so that at the intermediate stages from the beginning to the end node, all the intermediate hops do not have to participate. And at the final destination, uh, the CPU overhead is not needed at all, right? That's the idea. After the, you, uh, you register the memory and so forth. Yeah, of course. But if you have a conflict, I mean, then uh, it means that you have to agree between these two guys, right? So I think it's very complex. Uh, you don't you don't give any details, essentially, on uh, how complex is the coherency, but I believe it's very complex if you want to maintain the coherence globally, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, I mean, you, it's a global, uh, it's a software-managed global shared memory with uh, so there is a software acceleration, okay. yeah, it, with, but, but with a lot okay, of then, hardware acceleration for key, key pinch points. Thank you. Okay, we have time for these two questions over here. Hi, Nabil Damuni with Netronome. A question for Baba. Uh, you mentioned the Power Hub supports full virtualization. Can you elaborate more on the challenges and the features? I, it's, I mean, there's, I guess there's, you can take that in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, there's uh, uh, I/O virtualization, uh, where you know the the cluster network provides for the uh, the, the storage nodes, right? It's, it's, they're virtualized throughout the whole the cluster. Uh, in um, uh, and for example, the global shared memory, for example, the, the memory is virtualized right, throughout the system. So there's, uh, that, that sort of thing is what I was referring to there. So do you support SRIOV? Sorry? Uh, single root IOV, SRIOV, do you support that? SRIOV. Uh, uh, IO virtualization standards? Oh, uh, you know, that, I'm, I, don't quote me on that because I'm, I'm not probably the right person to talk about that aspect. Uh, there's a couple of guys, uh, you know, if you need more information on the HPC stack that I can get that. Thanks. Hi, Rick Merritt from EE Times. Uh, could you share a little bit about uh, the status of the PERC system design and, and the specifics of your performance and power and cost targets? Yeah, unfortunately, we're kind of at that phase uh, relative to the time at the conference. That you, that most of that will be forthcoming later this fall, more de a lot more detail. Uh, we're, uh, you know, we, we have silicon, we're, we have a, a second fast silicon and, you know, and bring up. So I think uh, maybe by supercomputing is where we're expecting to really roll out uh, yeah. both the, you know, the more details in the schedule and the actual metrics and the performance, which, uh, you know, we're not allowed yet to talk about. Okay, Andy, last question. Andy Glue, Intellectual Ventures. So you described the, well, your slide, the paper slides talked about the GUPS transaction. I think you called that mm -hmm. remote at atomic update. Mm -hmm. And I think you said that there were multiple independent 
atomic updates within the same flit. Mm -hmm. Is that true scatter gather? Are they constrained to be within the same cache line, within the same target? They, oh, so on the send side, uh, when you build a packet, let's say in the FIFO, right, uh, they would be in the same cache line. So it's a starting point, but they could be destined to go anywhere in the system. Not even to the same target? No. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're going to have to keep on time, move on to the next speaker. Let's um, thank our speakers from IBM again. And uh, if you have more questions, I'm sure they'll be available during the lunch break. Um, our next speaker is uh, Brian Welch from Luxterra, and he's going to tell you about 25 gigabit per second silicon photonics. Good, Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm Brian Welch. I'm with Luxterra. Uh, we're a silicon photonics company, or CMOS photonics company, and we've been in existence for about 10 years, developing, producing, shipping CMOS photonics components. The title of today's talks is Silicon Photonics, Optical Connectivity at 25 gigabit per, se gigabit per second and beyond. And really, it's a, it's a look into the technology and the optical components to see where the potential bottlenecks for performance are, if there are any. Um, and I say if there are any, that is relative to the electronics limitations that are inherent in any system development. So the talk, you know, we'll, we'll look at a little bit of the motivation, things you know, we're thinking, things we're hearing from our customer base, and then we'll get into the, the CMOS photonic technology and the light source. Uh, then we'll, we'll talk about the CMOS photonics transmitter and receiver, and these are the sort of the two key rate-dependent elements in any system. A little discussion about the medium, because the medium is also important, especially when you're talking about uh, multi-mode versus single-mode solutions, which we will, and then sort of the future of this technology and where we think we can take it. So, you know, our primary motivation is to, you know, meet the growing need of the interconnect industry. And, you know, there's a lot of push presently to get faster and faster. We've got 16 gig fiber channel out there, you know, already on the forefront development at 14 gig lanes. Uh, FDR InfiniBand is coming right behind it, also at 14 gig lanes. And then we're moving to 25 gig per lane speeds, EDR InfiniBand, potentially 100 gig Ethernet. Uh, and then we're up to 32 gig. So, you know, we look at the next two, three years and we see a pretty rapid ascension of data rates, as well as a rapid growth in parallelism of, of solutions. Uh, the reach of copper, of course, is diminishing with every iteration. Uh, it's, you know, maybe three meters is what I'm hearing in uh, 25 gig interconnects, and that's for more expensive copper as well. So there is a big opportunity here to both grow optics and scale, and therefore decrease them in, in price. There's also a lot of, uh, challenges in being able to do a system that is so used to copper and not only the cost but the power aspects of that and replace it all with optics. Um, one thing that we are really focused on doing is trying to remove interconnect limitations from interconnect fabrics. I mean it's it's been a long time that you know we've been working around trying to get copper faster as well as trying to deal with optics and their limitations but we believe that we can invert the paradigm so that you don't have to worry about the, the optics anymore, you don't have to worry about the interconnect anymore, you can focus on the electronics and the interconnect will keep pace. So let's look at sort of the existing solutions. I mean, silicon photonics is an existing solution, certainly it's out there, but the conventional solution is a, a VIXEL-based solution, a multi-mode solution. And what we've been seeing in scientific communities, as well as hearing from our customer base, is there are certain specific challenges inherent with this type of solution. Uh, one of them, which is probably the most often discussed, although maybe not the most, most important, is on the Vixel side its front. Vixel front itself, where we're used to, you know, pushing to higher and higher current densities to get to faster and faster modulation rates. But the flip side of that is as you do that, you know, the reliability of the component decreases. And, you know, as you're putting more and more optics into a system, you actually want the reliability to improve. So this is one specific limitation we're hearing from parties we're engaged with on the Vixel solution. Multimode fiber itself, of course, is also uh, a reach-limited medium. Uh, the faster you go, the shorter you can go. There are, of course, advances that are made in multimode fiber, and they will continue to be made, and it will help them. Uh, but ultimately, it's not sort of the unfettered reach 
that you uh, realistically see in, in single mode solutions, which uh, CMOS photonics is, and we'll discuss in a little bit. But perhaps the, the biggest challenge that, has, that, that we're hearing is on the receiver. And that is the photodiode's ability to collect and have enough responsivity to have a functioning link, and yet have low enough capacitance to enable the high-speed high speed, uh, TIA. So CMOS photonics. CMOS photonics exists. It exists for a while. It is product. It's qualified. It's shipping. There are 100,000 of CMOS photonics ICs out there today. The basic technology is an integration of optics into a CMOS electronic platform. We call it CMOS photonics you know, to sort of emphasize the fact that we are not just optics in silicon. It's really optics in an existing CMOS foundry. It uses an existing CMOS tool set, existing CMOS fab. It's fabricated at free scale. It doesn't have any custom tools at all in the, in the line. The process itself is as reliable as any CMOS technology, uh, you know, each JDEC uh, standards. Um, it is, you know, fit rate for an IC is what you'd expect anything, you know, single digit fit rates. Integrated on the die, we have a multitude of functionalities. We have all the electronics, of course. We also have almost all the optics, and I'll tell you why almost in just a second. The almost, whoops, wrong button. The almost is this red block. So the one thing that silicon cannot do efficiently at wavelengths we need to do is laze. So the laser is an external source, but there's only one of them. In all the solutions we've done, there's one laser that sits on top of the IC. From that laser, you can illuminate a multitude of transmitters. This here is a snapshot of an IC that is shipping today in a 40 gig bidirectional cable. So here we split a, a single optical input across four transmitters. And on the converse, we have four receivers. Photodiodes, completely integrated as well. All the modulations, optical routing, optical interface. We also integrate all the low speed digital functionality. So we have a full sort of transceiver from high speed to protocol level in a single chip. So looking at the, the CMOS Fanatic ecosystem, it looks pretty much like any CMOS ecosystem does. The design is done in a standard uh, CMOS tool set. You know, we do cadence, verify, and caliber. It's fabricated in a standard fab. It's portable, so the technology can scale to any fab, to any node. Uh, there's, there's really nothing custom about it. On the back end, everything is done wafer scale until it's in, actually packaged. That includes test, electrical and optical. So it's really very different than the conventional optics mode where you have discrete components tested often discreetly, but where physical assembly is required before you have a, a known product. On the light source side, we have a single laser. Thus far, all our products use single lasers. There's no reason we couldn't scale to more lasers if we're cramming lots and lots of channels in there. We haven't needed to. It's a, a continuous wave laser. It's not modulated. It's a you know, very low cost, very high reliability, telecom grade laser. And by using a single laser across multiple channels, we can save a lot of cost, a lot of power. The reliability is very high because you know, this one laser has a fit of about one. Presently, from this one laser, we can ship about 150 gigabits per second of throughput. That means either serially or splitting it. That's sort of what the link will support. We're working on technology to bring us to 300 to 400 gigs uh, in the near future to service this two to three year uh, development that I was discussing. Now, because silicon is absorbing you know, at low wavelengths, we have to use long wavelength, at short wavelengths, we use long wave solutions. So 850 is out. Uh, it'll operate anything, anywhere from around 1260, which is sort of the single mode fiber cutoff, up to about 1570, where the germanium that's used for photodiodes starts to lose responsivity. And another advantage of having the single external laser is actually we can make our solutions fully hermetic. Uh, the laser is packaged, mounted, can be mounted wafer scale on top of the IC in a fully sealed package, which meets all Telecordia standards. So on the transmit side, uh, the transmitter conceptually is very simple. It's a mock center interferometer, which means you basically have two arms which have optoelectric phase shifters that create interference or destruction. So our phase shifters use carry depletion, depletion uh, they're reverse bias P injunctions. So the theoretical speed limit is limited really just by the relax relaxation time of that junction. 
which gives it a bandwidth of 160 gigahertz. So you know, well above um, sort of the electrical limitations you, you see in most technologies today. Also, because it's integrated, we can do a lot of unique architectures, which we'll discuss a little bit more on the next page, including what's shown on the bottom. Whoops, apologies. Including the bottom here, which is distribution of the MZI driver. And here what we do is we distribute the driver across the length of the optics. And that enables us to do waveform shaping to, to further optimize the link, as well as pretty dramatic power reductions. The power dissipated in this modulator here, which is a 10 gig modulator shown as 40 milliwatts, or about four milliwatts per gig per second for the transmission. On the electronics, we have a bunch of innovation that went into to making, high speed, to making our high speed roadmap possible. Key among them is sort of stacked domains. Modulators, be them you know, lasers or uh, mock senders, like high voltage swings, but CMOS does not. So what we've done is we've actually split the domains so we drive the anodes and cathodes of the diode separately, and each of those domains only sees half of what the modulator needs. So that enables us to operate under one volt headroom, uh, and it can be scaled down, of course. Because it's distributed, and the interconnection is a via, you know, a very low parasitics. So we're not going to run into limitations like you might see in a multi-part solution where the, the connection between a driver and a laser, be it a wire bond or whatever, really becomes a limiting factor. Uh, you know, the, our interconnect is femped up pairs of capacitance. So what we're looking at here is sort of a, a vintage MZI. And I'll say vintage because this was produced in 2006. Since then, and this was a large DOE run of, of standalone mock senders. Since then, we've done mostly system dies. So we haven't done much individual breakout components, uh, just in the optics. But here we have a, a 25 gig component, a 25 gig modulator, running four picoseconds of jitter. We're about two picoseconds from the test environment. So you know, clearly, we can get you know, very high speed modulation out of this technology. And you know, as long as the, the electronics, which is you know, the IRTS roadmap, continues to keep up, it'll continue to enable these types of, of performances. On the receiver, we, we are very, very different from the existing solutions. We're not a surface illuminated receiver. We're a laterally illuminated photodiode. And what that means is our light is coupled in, in this plane, this is a picture of receiver here, on a waveguide, and then absorbed on germanium on top of it. What that does is we've decoupled sort of the collection of light at the silicon fiber boundary from the absorption of light. So we can independently optimize the, the I.O., the optical I.O., and the receiver. Conventional solutions, you, you don't have that, so you're left with two different types of optimization. You can do transit time optimization through uh, reducing the depletion thickness, as well as um, reducing the capacitance, you know, reducing the area to try to get you know, higher bandwidth. So theoretically, I mean, we're, we are just a transit time limited problem. Our photodiode is, is so small, it's five microns long, it's got about 10 femtofarads of capacitance. It is, you know, by far not the dominant thing in receiver, determining receiver sensitivity. So really the only component that limits the upper end on a, on a photodiode is a transit time for us. And with the, with the existing part we have now, we're at about 55 gigahertz of receiver bandwidth. On the electronics front, this very low capacitance photodiode enables us to make some very unique receivers. We're fully integrated with almost no capacitance of nodes, so we can actually do very, very high resistance, very high sensitivity equal receivers, which are 5 to 10 dB beyond what you can get with a surface illuminated detector. And this is another thing, we're, area we're going to expand, we're going to work on, that enables us to get so much throughput per laser and per unit of power, optical power. And you know, experimentally here, this is a somewhat newer vintage of, of part, but you know, here we have a 25 gigabit per second uh, photodiode running relatively seamlessly. Again, it's tested as, as a discrete component, um, but it's, you know, of course, fully integrated with our technology. So beyond those two items, I mean, there are a bunch of other sort of passive optical components that exist in our high-speed paths. Um, 
On the transmit side, we receive and transmit through single polarization grading couplers, which are used when you have a known polarization of light. We have a multitude of waveguide photo, uh, waveguides, splitters, combiners, as well as uh, monitor photodiodes for low speed control, monitoring, any kind of functionality you can imagine. Um, our photodiodes are free, so we use a lot of them. We have about 40 on most solutions and, and, and rising. The interconnect, as I mentioned, we use single mode fiber. Uh, it has its strengths and weaknesses, of course. I mean, the fiber itself is, is you know, very long reach. We've gone up to four kilometers at 10 gig. It's very low cost. Uh, some of the limitations you tend to get in when you look at the connectorizing solutions. On the receiver, we, we, we have a slightly different interface, which is uh, polarization splitting. And then I, that enables us to detect any polarization of light. So we don't need polarization maintaining fiber. And it splits the light, which is then received by sort of the, the dual port photodiode, which collects both polarities. So in terms of looking at, you know, are these limiting factors or met these limiting factors in a solution, the answer is essentially no. I mean, the grading couplers show no discernible rate dependence. The waveguides and splitters could if they were really long, but we're talking hundreds of meters, you know, lengths that are never going to happen on chip. So for all intents and purposes, the, they will scale indefinitely with the technology. The fiber, you know, there is dispersion in single mode fiber when you get into, you know, multiple kilometers of lengths, um, and that, you know, will come down a little bit as you go faster and faster, but it's still so far beyond sort of the, the short reach markets that we're looking at and where we think the low cost of photonics is gonna make a difference that it's you know, not gonna be a factor for, for many, 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 many generations. So where are we taking this in the future? Um, the future includes actually a lot of things that are in development today. Uh, we're definitely, you know, involved niche in single channel, very high rate solutions. We've sort of stayed out of single channel space because it's relatively commoditized, but when you're talking 16, 32, 40 gig solutions, uh, we see this opportunity there. Four channel is sort of our bread and butter. Um, I mean, we do InfiniBand cables now. We'll continue the FDR, EDR, cable might be useful for, for ethernet, as well as high rate uh, parallelized fiber channel switch to switch links. And then there's really high port counts, 12 ports, 16 ports, 16 by 25, you know, moving to 300 gig, 400 gig interconnects, you know, not just in a, in a you know, cable, which is sort of the product we have now, but really in a very small form factor, uh, embeddable solution, kind of like what uh, colleagues from IBM were, were, were discussing. I mean, you know, this solution here, if you looked at a 16 by 25 gig solution, it's just a single chip, about six millimeters on a side. So it's a very small, very high density interconnect. You know, in long term, you know, video, you know, keeps say the 3D, 4D, 5D. I don't know how many dimensions they'll put in there, but they'll keep wanting more bandwidth. And, and there will be a point when this, when the CMOS photonics is, is cheap enough to readily service that. When copper there really starts to run into the limitations that we're seeing in enterprise now. So, in conclusion, I mean, CMOS photonics is a capable technology. Uh, the optics will go, will modulate, you know, theoretically up to 320 gigs and detect up to 110. So really what we've shown is that anything you do in CMOS photonics is limited by the CMOS, not the photonics. And as long as the CMOS keeps scaling, which it will, the optical interconnects, the interconnects will scale. So being tied to sort of the host development is good for us. It enables us to track their progress more quickly and not have to churn dramatic optical innovation year after year after year after year. Also, you know, because we're CMOS, uh, we have sort of the reliability that, you know, we hear and we expect, will be expected to really get the optics where people want it to be. You know, single fits, getting it in the system, getting it so it's not the weakest link, hopefully getting it so it's the strongest link. Um, that's about it. I'd like to acknowledge the, the team at Lextera who, you know, they made all this possible. I get to present it, but they're, you know, behind the curtains doing tremendous amount of works every day, uh, trying to get this making this a reality and continuing to make it a better reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Questions? Uh, yeah, Bob Ciotti, NASA Ames. Uh, our biggest supercomputer has about 40 miles of uh, optical cable in it, order 15,000 headers. Um, is 10 to the 15th is a bit error rate enough? Certainly you observe higher than that, 
but testing to um, higher than 10 to the 15th seems to be a trouble. And in the headers, for instance, have you put any thought into uh, detecting problems with the cable and potentially lighting up something in the header instead of relying on something upper level to deal with that issue? I mean, we've certainly experienced broken fiber and issues like that. So uh, there's sort of two questions in there. I mean, one, on the reliability front, we're definitely, or on the, on the fit rate, sorry, the bit error rate front, we're definitely trying to push it uh, really low. Um, we've characterized our components to be 10 to the minus 18. Um, in terms of the detection and monitoring, we presently have various features built in to detect faults in optical links, um, potential intrusions. There's, there's one particular one that was, was you know, requested by various agencies that are very interested in security that you know, we can detect if anyone is, is messing with fiber anywhere in the link at any end and flag it. In terms of really advanced, um, you know, sort of, you know, bit error rate monitoring and reporting, that's not something we've we've integrated simply because of the the cost, power, complexity is more than we've been willing to uh, accept at this point in in what is you know we hope to be a, a relatively dumb ODE converter and not a really complex system. Another question. Uh, yeah, Nathan Brookwood from Inside 64. Can you tell us a little bit about the connectorizing problem? Uh, how do you actually get the connection from the chip onto the board, and how do you get the connection from the board out to the actual fiber? Well, the, the, the product we have today is an active cable. So the fiber is attached directly to the IC, uh, and then it's pluggable through a QSFP. Um, embedded products, there are various surface, in terms of PCB connectors, the various schemes, there's you know, pluggable connectors, which tend to be relatively large, there's compression sockets like, like IBM is deploying, which are very small, but a little more costly. And you know, we, we're actually looking at deploying both of those. We have deployed the connectorized one. We have a smaller plug-on module. But the really small density one, we are actually looking to deploy in the near future. On the optics front, um, optical connectors tend to, single mode connectors tend to be uh, somewhat pricey because they haven't been deployed in tremendously high volumes. Uh, we're working with a bunch of connector um, suppliers to bring that down, both through volume as well as enabling new test solutions, whatever, via what we can do in silicon to make their connectors better, to make their operations in building the connector better. Okay, thank you. I'll ask a connect, uh, question as well. Um, how would you compare the technology you just got done describing to the uh, technology that Intel uh, described yesterday and has been making so much noise about in the press? Uh, I'm afraid I missed Intel's talk yesterday, but I, I'm definitely familiar with their um, silicon work. And you know, in, in principle, it's it's, it's a comparable concept. Um, and you know, I applaud them for for endorsing it and advertising it so heavily because we, we fully believe it. We do a couple of, of very different things. Uh, chief among them is sort of how we collect the light. We use a vertically incident um, creating coupler, which enables us to have a, a chip without a broken guard ring that's testable wafer scale. Unless something different, differently was announced yesterday, uh, my understanding of Intel is they have a sort of an edge coupled interface, which is, you know, we view that as, as quite a bit more difficult to not only test with, but manufacture with. Um, you know, but there's, there's, there is interest besides Intel in that type of, type of interface. So, you know, certainly I kind of dismiss it as a, as a, you know, potential for proliferation of silicon photonics. And, you know, however they do that, do it, we think it's, uh, it's a good industry for there to be more players in. So. Okay. Well, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> the um, final speaker in the session is uh, Marcello Coppola from uh, ST Microelectronics. Marcello is the R&D director, uh, and uh, he's in charge of the SpiderGon network on chip research and its transfer into product. Marcello? So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, today is an honor for me to be here, also to speak about spider Gunnestinok. Just uh, in the talk today, I'm going to illustrate what is spider Gunnestinok, how it will be used inside uh, our products. What is important before introducing these uh, technologies, uh, 
to give you a little bit more information about the context. What is important is uh, to understand what is uh, going on from the product. Let's uh, take an example from the mobile phone. So what happening is uh, really now the device is getting very complex. So we are moving uh, something uh, very static uh, in the previous generation was uh, the GSM uh, where the user or mainly the OM the, or, or the operator was able uh, to provide you an environment where uh, you are not able to, uh, to set uh, or to add a new application. Now we are moving in something very open. So the, each user is able to add a new application. Each user is able to uh, customize the device, also to have a different usage of those uh, devices. So if I use a mobile phone, I use it now one manner. If my child uses the mobile phone, I use a completely different manner. This is, uh, has a big impact on the architecture, and also the way how we are going to build the system. So if we look from the architectural point of view for this kind of system, we are moving from a single, single uh, uh, microprocessor system on chip where we had just one single core with some accelerator. We move in the past generation where we have several core, still some hardware accelerator, and then uh, one single crossbar or a sort of hierarchy of crossbar. Uh, now we are moving something very open because in some way we need to reconfigure, we need to reprogram those devices also when uh, on the field. So this means uh, the user in some way can uh, change the behavior of the device. For instance, if I use the device in an airplane, I need to shut down one part of my device, otherwise I'm not allowed to use. If I use my device in a specific context, the, complete, uh, the device will act in a completely different manner. For this reason, from the uh, software point of view, we start to add the OS. The OS is getting more and more complex. Android is a really a clear example of what you are going to put in this mobile phone. And then we start to put on top of it middleware. Middleware is very famous, for instance, for set of box, where uh, we have the OS is Linux or something else. And then we have this middleware able to you put a lot of security on top of the bare system. And then we have the final application. Those applications could be the provided by the, I mean, who provide the device or could be completely provided by the, an open community. So for instance, this is an example for iPhone. This is an example for Android. But also this is happening on the set-top box. So now also the set-top box is open up. So this means the user can add a new application. Also I can download those applications in my set-top box. From the hardware point of view, this means uh, we start to add a lot of uh, processing elements. And what is important is for those elements uh, in this specific context is not uh, high performance computing, but we are speaking about consumer devices. The number of processing elements are completely heterogeneous. So I mean, so we have, uh, for instance, ARM core, or I have Intel core, and then I start close to them, I have other core, it could be Tensilia, it could be other time of core, and then I still have the hardware accelerator. This was uh, one slide with, uh, we used uh, four years ago when we started the spider Gunistinoc research program. The idea at that time was, uh, uh, our vision was uh, really to imagine uh, the, the template for a system on chip uh, where we have several uh, processors. At that time it was a DSP, VLW, and hardware IP. And then we had the two kinds of mainly interconnect. One we call the SOC interconnect, the SOC backbone, and the other is the, uh, interconnect, the small interconnect you see on the uh, top right, uh, right hand side. Today, if I, I use this picture for uh, try to, uh, to represent the today's SOC, see, this is really the imaging what we are doing today in, uh, mobile, uh, in uh, consumer device. This is not only done inside ST, but if I look at chip coming from Qualcomm, Freescale, Infineon, all the major Samsung, all the major companies acting in these domains, 
in some way I can represent uh, this kind of uh, template. What is important is uh, today is uh, going to appear uh, this part here is what we call the many core or the multi core area where we put a lot of small cores and this is a lot to provide a specific acceleration. This acceleration could be for video, so this is for GP, GPU is an example, or uh, for graphics, sorry, is a GPU an example, or for video, or for other kind of domains. So this is something happening also on this kind of system. So now we are moving to spider gonist what is a spider gonist uh, Just uh, let me present just one marketing slide and then uh, a more technical slide. So what is spider gonist is a way to support uh, several protocols. Because a company like uh, ST, uh, what we are doing today is we develop less and less IP internally. We buy a lot of IP externally. We need to integrate. For instance, we integrate the core, we integrate the, uh, the GPU, we integrate other stuff. All those components is coming with uh, some uh, standard interface. Uh, those are o OCP, AMBA, X53, X54. Uh, then we can have something custom. What we need is very a uh, technology able to plug all those, uh, uh, all those elements uh, very quickly in a, in a system. And then uh, what is very important is uh, the time closure, also all the problem I have on the back end. Using an OCT technology allowed me to reduce the number of wires. In some way, I'm able to distribute. Instead of having one single big crossbar, I'm able to distribute my uh, network around my chip. This will allow me to simplify my design and also to speed up the backend phase. Another important point is uh, to build, to, to create this kind of system. Uh, today we need a lot of money to have uh, one single sock in uh, uh, 45 or 32 nanometer. Using this kind of technology that allowed me to reduce also in every cost. And then uh, it's very important also uh, to have a sort of configurable extensible technology on top of the uh, spider gun technology in order to instantiate this, uh, 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 the spider gun stinock. This gives you what is spider gun stinock today. We can see is uh, we have the standard uh, spider gun stinock backbone. The backbone is the standard uh, uh, network on chip. It could be a two dimension, it could be anything. In this case, for uh, consumer application, is really a custom topology. On top of it, what we have, we have uh, services, platform services, could be security, power, uh, MMU, fault tolerance, virtual channel, uh, uh, QoS, and so on. Those services will be instantiated per uh, specific domains. So I can have some domains using some specific services, other domains for this automotive using uh, something different for this fault tolerance and that kind of stuff. For communication primitives, it's very important. Today is maybe shared and memory, so use the standard uh, read and write protocol. But in the near future, we can have other uh, protocol, like could be the cache currents, it could be the message passing. At this point, uh, I need to introduce a little bit some complexity on the communication primitives. Now I'm going to illustrate what is the spider gun stinock backbone. I'm going very fast because at the end is something very common. So what is important, we have the router as uh, the network. The network interface is the place where I plug my IP. What is very important is uh, we have two levels of serialization. One is here. Here we talk about 200, 300 wires. Here we reduce by alpha the number of wires. And on top of it, I'm able to make also wire reduction between one router to the other. This allows me also to, to optimize better uh, the topology compared to the application I have to run on top of it. What is important in this slide is we have a free component, a physical link. In general, when we talk about link, it's just a set of wires. For us, link is not a set of wires, it's wires plus logic. I have some slides illustrating what are the links. This is a slide that gives you just uh, some problem we are facing. For instance, if I would like to connect an IP talking XI with an IP talking OCP, I need some way to make some sort of translation. The way we do today is without bridging. So this means we are able in a uh, in a smart way to translate the communication is something understandable. 
And this allowed us to don't lose, sorry, don't lose any clock cycle during this uh, translation phase. So this is uh, done uh, really at uh, when we transfer uh, the information. And then uh, what is very important also, the upsize and downsize conversion. Uh, if we look now, and we are moving, I'm going to illustrate you all those components, uh, the architecture of those components. For instance, the network interface, as you can see, is very modular component. We have uh, the shell is uh, the place where I do this protocol conversion. And then we have the kernel. The kernel is the common part where uh, I convert this parallel protocol, like XSigns and PIC packet base. So here you have the place where I have the FIFO. And then I have some other block like error management unit, uh, the interface. What is very important is uh, when we develop, for instance, a new protocol, the only part we develop is the green part, I mean the shell. All the other parts I'm going to reuse. This is a way also to reduce, to improve the productivity uh, when we develop, uh, we use this uh, technology. This is just some uh, feature of the network interface. What is very important to capture here is uh, the pipeline stages. We, we can have uh, from zero to three cycle of uh, pipeline stages. And this is something the architecture of the SOC will design. So at the end, uh, uh, this depends on the frequency, but also depends uh, if is it a place where I need to go fast, so latency sensitive, or is some uh, place where I need to get some bandwidth. So this is something we have, uh, from this slide, you can understand the number of parameters one architect has to define for each network interface. Another important point is also the frequency conversion. We use the standard technique for frequency conversion. Uh, for the router, uh, is uh, the standard router uh, uh, where uh, we are able, uh, I mean, to send packet around. So this means we are able to move fleet. Uh, uh, each fleet is able to route in any kind of port. What is very important is uh, for this, uh, the current uh, architecture, we support up to two virtual channel, but. Uh, this depends uh, really on the application. If we use just one virtual channel, all the logic of the second virtual channel will be completely removed. So at the end, uh, you understand from this slide how configurable must be the technology because uh, since uh, the cost of the number of gates is very important, uh, it's very important uh, when the architect instantiates uh, one component, we need to remove all the remaining uh, part of the logic we don't use. This is also very important for the power consumption. We don't need to have extra gate doing nothing in our design. Another important point is the way I can use this uh, topology. I can use uh, really, for instance, uh, like in the building topology like two dimension. In this case, uh, I have the requested resp response switch uh, doing uh, in uh, one single switch. Or I can use the, re the, the router uh, using uh, to build one request and one response network. This is very nice because uh, since we are in a consumer domain, I can differentiate the, the request network from the response network. For instance, if I am in a set of box, I have more read than write. So this case is better. I create one network uh, for the read where I'm able to support better the throughput. And then I have a different network going for the request. So this is a way to optimize how the application can act, also to get all the possible performance out for the small area I have behind. Those are some features, for instance, we can support any kind of fleet. So we don't have, we can support 16, 32, 128. So this is really an element the architect will define, and this element will define in terms coming from the application. So this means it depends uh, on the bandwidth I need to support, uh, I need to set a fleet side in a specific manner. Well, another important point is we have output queuing and input queuing. Uh, either the input output queuing could be disabled. In this case, when, for instance, the output queue is not used, all the logic for the output queue will be completely removed. Again, for the input buffer, this is very important to avoid any, any bubble or any when I transmit. So 
since the communication between two routers, uh, the router, the network interface is using credit base, uh, I have to respect the number of this buffer that will be depend on the around trip delay in order to set those uh, information. Then for the link, as I mentioned before, the link is not just a set of wires, but is a set of wires plus logic. Why? Because we need, what we would like is to achieve is to set a different wire that depends on the part of the system where I'm going to use my network. For instance, if you see, if I have a long wire, I can use, for instance, what we call an adaptive version link, or I can have a synchronous version of the short wire. This is something the design or the architect can, from the input coming from the back end, can choose. What is very important when you use one link or the other link, the interface between the component, the link is completely standard. So this is completely uh, flexible. I don't have uh, any impact on the component. Uh, this is going very fast. In order to support, we support the GALS approach, I means. Uh, we need, in order to cope with long distance inside the chip, in order to support what we use is the latency insensitive system. This means uh, uh, we have this synchronous island we put with some shell, and uh, with the, between the shell, in order to cut the, the path, I, I put what is the relay station. There are a lot of paper on this uh, methodology. We use, we apply this methodology in our uh, technology. So today, for instance, when, I use, when I'm going to instantiate an adaptive link, I can use the link in a different manner. For instance, in the first, in the first configuration, I use the link to break the long link, so I use the link as a relay station. I can have the link to have a sort of uh, frequency con uh, conversion, so I move from an island running on one frequency to another island running on another frequency. So I use, so it's just another instance of the link. Or I can do size conversion, so I can do a, 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 I have a fleet at 32 bits, and then I move off to a fleet at 64 bits. Then I can have also voltage uh, area, so I can have one part of my chip running uh, one, single, one voltage, and then I have to move my network to another part of the chip running another voltage. What is important is I need a specific uh, component is the voltage conversion because uh, from technology point of view, I need to instantiate some specific uh, cell coming from the technology in order to cope with this uh, different voltage island. You can understand from this high fre uh, flexibility, I'm able to cope with the different uh, frequency, I'm able to cope with the different uh, voltage island. So the architect really have the, a lot of freedom to build the system in a different manner. I'm gonna try to, uh, to speed up a little bit. Uh, let me just introduce uh, what is the user experience. Uh, user experience is something very important when we build a device. It's not directly to build the device, but the final uh, uh, company like it could be or the OM. It's very important, really, to have a marketing, uh, uh, to be appealing on the market side. For this reason, what we would like to achieve with these technologies is to provide to, the, uh, to, the, to our customer or to the OEM or something, a way to customize uh, the device in a specific manner. So in some way, what we would like is to have this uh, loop between uh, the software, the software could be the end user, or could be the core application, could be something else, to the platform we have behind. The platform can provide some feedback, and then with this loop, we are able to optimize our system. Uh, for this reason, the Spider-Gon is not only a piece of uh, hardware, but we have also the services. The services are implemented partially in hardware, partially in software, this is a way, when we, de uh, when we deliver, or when we have one instance of the Spider-Gon we have the hardware for the hardware engineer, but also we are able to deliver the, a software stack. The software stack is going to the software developing guy, so it could be internal, it could be externally, and then uh, it's up uh, to the 
to the uh, who build the SOC to decide which way I'm going to use uh, those uh, services. This is an example of what we do today with Android. Today, the way to access the contents, to access the information for the NOC, we use the uh, DestiNOC content provider uh, is something uh, standard on Android. And then uh, using this approach, this API, I'm able, for instance, uh, to customize the power, the QS, security, MMU, uh, diagnostic, and so on. I have one example. Uh, this is, uh, the, I'm going uh, a little bit fast here. So today, the we have two components mainly in the software. One is the device driver for the NOC. This is standard device driver for as any IP. And on top of it, we have what we call the libest NOC. The libest NOC is really a library of component able to uh, provide you some services. Those services could be, for instance, uh, to know from one single uh, processing element, what are the destinations I'm uh, visible. For instance, I'm able to set uh, some specific information QS. I'm able to do something on power and so on. So this is something the application could use or could be used completely from, from, from the middleware. So this is really a way I've been thought this lib stinoc. This is an example. Today, LibSTNOC is a component inside Android where we have several uh, libraries. And then we have uh, the content provider. Is the content provider is a way, I mean, how we are able to access uh, uh, those services. Uh, for instance, a possible application could be a way to debug the NOC, to have a, a graphical uh, debugging for all the, the interconnect. For this, I'm able to see where I'm going to have the, how the packet is going through my network. Or can use this for performance or low power. Or can use this, for instance, to set my uh, devices uh, using it in a standby, if I use it in flying mode, or if I using it in a call mode. Again, this is, was the picture. Just I'm giving you the, an example for QoS. Imagine I have the device, so I open uh, uh, the web browser. So at this point, using the web browser, what we can think is we can set up uh, the web browser that can ca call uh, some specific uh, API or the library. So they're going uh, directly to the hardware and, and they program the network in order to act in a different manner. So this will give, you, uh, will give to the end user a better user experience. The user experience could be faster reacting time, better latency, for instance, uh, doing a nice way to surf on the web and so on. Another important point is uh, the killer, one killer application is FaceTime. This is an application for uh, Apple, uh, the phone. We can find the same application also in uh, Android-like phones. For this kind of application, what is important is really when we need to use the wireless LAN, also we need to ensure a certain bandwidth in order to have a smooth way of those visual communication between the two devices. Again, using the previous approach, I'm able to change a little bit some parameter. This is just an, an idea is from the from the application, I'm able to go the host processor, the host processor, uh, able with uh, just running the, the libest inoc plus the device driver, disable to change, for instance, the allocation bandwidth for uh, the external memory. Changing this uh, could be done at runtime. So this is uh, very important. It uh, depends on which profile I'm able to run my device. So this uh, will give you a lot of flexibility in particular, it gives you a lot of flexibility to the end customer or all the end user. This is really how those features could be used at the end. Uh, for this reason, uh, is we introduced a new terminology because NOC so far was just an hardware piece. We call those kind of elements interconnect processing unit in the sense is a component composed by hardware and software where the software is playing an important uh, role. Today, where is uh, Spidergon? Spidergon uh, today is, uh, uh, is a technology where uh, all the product, in, uh, next generation product in ST, I mean, uh, coming from next year, we have uh, a lot of bunch of products using uh, this technology. 
also to the, uh, for the multimedia and uh, mobile. For instance, also we are licensing this technology also to mobile, to ST Ericsson uh, company using uh, for the uh, uh, application processor. Uh, what is very important is, uh, uh, this is just, and then I close my talk, how we use this technology, the real device. At the end, uh, since those devices, is, they are uh, very complex, uh, just to give you some number, Today, with the current device, we have uh, around uh, 200, 150, 200 processing elements from an uh, initiator point of view and 150 from the target point of view. In order uh, to cope with those complexity, we use what we call an hybrid NOC. So we have all the central part doing the interconnect process, uh, all the fast part doing the NOC. And then we have on the border side, we use the standard bus. Could be the OCP bus, could be the Exxon. So this is a way to concentrate, also to reduce the, uh, to simplify the architecture, the topology for those uh, devices. Uh, if you would like to know, we have a lot of website where uh, this project has been developed. There's a book uh, we talk about a little bit more about Spider Gun Stock. Thank you very much. Uh, Do we have any uh, questions about the uh, Spider-Gon ST knock? Hi, this is Sisi from uh, Sisi Yuan from Huawei Technologies. Wondering whether you have any comparison sheet uh, with other standard knocks like a mesh, constraint mesh, or even flattened butterfly. Thank you. Uh, yes, today for uh, uh, for the other knock. Uh, uh, when we use the NOC in a consumer device, the topology is completely custom. This means we never use, for instance, to dimension butterfly this kind of NOC. So we use really a custom topology in some way reflecting what is the, what is the bandwidth required by the application. So if I compare to other uh, NOC in topology, we cannot have this comparison because any device is a different NOC. If uh, I would like to compare this technology with other commercial solution provide the NOC, the main difference is all these software part, the way how the application is able to access those services, this is the main differentiation point. I 100% I agree. So you are more flexible because all those, uh, uh, lots of features are configurable. So that's your advantage, but just wondering, uh, because uh, there's the flexibility, you may sacrifice anything uh, when you compare with other non-configurable mesh. That's why I'm asking. Thank you. But. OK. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank Marcello again. There is